It's so great to be here and to be talking a little bit about how cities might be useful for all of you doing gamification projects. Here's my pitch to you, uh, that actually we've been doing gamification uh, and drawing on play in cities for not just decades, but actually hundreds of years. And if we draw on a little of that rich history, our projects with gamification uh, not only can be richer, but actually need to go in some of those directions. Uh, I, I believe that the future of gamification increasingly is going to rely on being inclusive and not just appealing to players who like points and leaderboards. Nothing wrong with points and leaderboards, but it's not enough. And I think increasingly it's going to be a brittle strategy that will break when we really push for broader inclusion. Communities in particular are places where people demand to be part of the community, part of the space. Um, and I have a book that came out, uh, as I said, from MIT Press uh, that I'm partly pitching. I'm gonna, in this talk, show a few examples from that, a number of different games in cities. And I'm gonna argue that we can pull from those examples to understand gamification in terms that are a little deeper, deeper principles for play that can be applied for gamification or in many other places. So that's the argument. Uh, let me actually give a quick preview uh, for, for what we're talking about by jumping straight into the first criteria. Uh, I wanted to talk about a better definition rather than just gamification as a, as a general concept. I call things game-based. Uh, and that's partly because I think that if we just talk about gamification as totally separate from games, uh, we can start to lose track of some of those deeper principles. So I, I actually don't want to recognize that, that we're basing uh, gamification often on deeper principles of games. The first element that I argue is really important are playful challenges. Uh, and let me, let me give an example of what that looks like in cities. What you're looking at here is a skyscraper in Philadelphia uh, where uh, the Guinness World Record was set uh, for the largest video game display. Uh, first with uh, uh, Pong and then Tetris. This is the 2014 Tetris display. It's a 119,000 square foot display. Um, and uh, frankly, Drexel helped make this project come to fruition. What I want to just point to here is that this is a playful experience. Um, where one person is getting to play Tetris, but there are many watchers and observers. And I think this is a, a crucial lesson that we can draw on from cities, is that even when someone is playing in public space, whether that's playing you know, dominoes uh, at a park, uh, whether they're playing basketball, there are almost always more people who are not playing. And the importance of the non-player is going to be only of growing uh, centrality as we think about gamification. And I think cities help us think of that space first. Cities have always had to think about what's the role for people who are not immediately playing. And, and I think that this is, uh, this is one of those pieces. The key here in terms of uh, playfulness is that it's a, an attitude. It's not a technology. You, you can't add playfulness as just a feature. Uh, it's really trying to pursue this attitude towards space uh, and towards uh, each other. This attitude is actually something that is often missing in gamification projects. Uh, gamification can quickly turn into a competition where people try to race to the top. And, and, and so what begins in a playful way can lose its playfulness quite quickly. And for those who are watching, it doesn't feel playful at all. Um, what I like about this, this uh, demonstration is that it just, uh, it has this sense of a broader audience and it, it has that playfulness at the core. Here it's drawing on gamer culture with things like Tetris, but it doesn't have to be drawing on digital culture. Let me offer another example. Uh, this is a great example uh, from, uh, called the Big Urban Game, a 2003 project that took place in the Twin Cities. Minneapolis St. Paul here in the United States. Uh, and a number of different uh, game artists and designers helped produce this project. Um, this is not drawing on digital culture, but definitely drawing on uh, with the giant inflatable play piece um, aspects of play culture. Now, this intriguing game was played by a combination of in-person events and online tracking, specifically, people online could watch video and a map uh, showing where 
uh, this particular, uh, these pieces were, were moving through the city and they could vote. So some of the action here was not individual, I'm going to do move my piece, but rather I'm going to weigh in on this collective challenge of where should our piece go? This is also cities something that cities are much better with their game experiences than a lot of gamification projects. A lot of gamification projects are still very individualistic. We're gonna give just this one person feedback as opposed to letting a group of people weigh in together. Uh, when we're focused on community, as today is in the gamification conference, uh, community is often about that we, it's about that collective. And I think that uh, cities have a much richer history in thinking about that, that kind of group play. The interesting piece here is that as the pieces moved through the city and people voted for their path, trying to move their piece and be the first over to a particular location across the city, the, the uh, audience, the watching audience uh, had a, a lower level of participation, but they could also turn out in person and watch the pieces or even sometimes help these pieces along. Uh, I think of this in terms of the next criteria uh, for uh, games that I wanted to talk about, which is feedback loops. So feedback loops mean that when an action is taken, we give people feedback on that action often as quickly as possible. This is a little bit different than saying we need a feature like points or we need a feature like leaderboards or we need a feature like badges. I think all of those actually, you can get lose track of the deeper principle, which is that when you make a choice, when you take action, there's some feedback on your action. If we're instead trying to amplify feedback, I think we'll be in a much better place to design play. Um, this is an example of, uh, of feedback, but there are actually many in the physical world that we can be thinking about. I wanted to mention a game called Macon Money that took place in Macon, Georgia. Uh, this is a game that took place uh, in a city that has a, a university area, but also a historic community that didn't integrate super well with the university. And so some of the goals of this game project were to get residents and some of the college students intermingling, especially a lot across lines of race and class. It was a historic African-American community. It was an older community that was near the university. And so the way this game was played um, was actually with uh, an alternative currency that was paper. You can see here in the image, uh, here are two different halves of one of these bonds. And when players can unite the two halves, they can trade it in for a coupon to local businesses. And in this way, support the local economy and get some goods themselves, whether that's uh, buying some chicken wings uh, or, or even uh, uh, clothing. So uh, the about $63,000 uh, were pumped into the community. So in that sense, it's a direct economic development program. It's not just for engagement. It's actually part of economic development and shifting how money flows in the local economy. But on the engagement side, one of the interesting twists that the game design uh, tackled was to break these physical pieces of money, uh, these making money bonds in half and to mail them to different zip codes. So that you often had to find somebody who wasn't from your neighborhood in order to go and cash it in. This is a fairly small challenge, but this is the key to go back to my criteria for game-based. It is a challenge. We're making something like a coupon system, which of course coupons are widely used around the world. We're actually making it harder to use the coupon. And this is at first glance counterintuitive, right? Don't we want people actually using the coupons? Don't we want them getting into our stores? Yes, but games, as part of their principle, calibrate the level of challenge. That is a, a really part of the heart of what they do. And in this way, they are fundamentally different from something like a tool. A good tool is as efficient as possible. You want to be done as quickly as possible. But a good game, the goal in chess is not to finish as quickly as possible. It's to win the game and actually to stay engaged uh, through that meaningful experience. So the right level of challenge helps is one of the ways, uh, one of the essential ways that games accomplish their work is by calibrating challenge. So in this game, uh, the challenge is to meet people. And the way that the game does it is partly by uh, leveraging and building upon existing community events. This is a, uh, a picture of some of the people in the community when they met up uh, to trade in their, um, their halves to get whole uh, making money bonds that they could go spend in local businesses. Interestingly, these pictures were standardized as part of the game. So if you think of one of your gamification tools being uh, selfies, 
that are then republished. This is an amazing kind of community marketing project where the taking of pictures uh, in the game system then becomes reposted on social media, becomes visible to that broader community and audience of who are we, who is making, who are the people coming together? Uh, and of course their smiles and joy uh, is something that is also great for the community understanding where it can grow, uh, how people can come together. So the challenge here uh, it is expressed in a feedback loop that includes social media, that includes photography. And for me, this is so much richer than something like points. Oh, you could give them five points. And yes, we are giving them actual money. So for many of them, they're participating for the money. But a critical part of the feedback loop is also this social media and photography kind of feedback system. Let me trace through some of the other ways that the uh, game does this combines the challenge and feedback systems. So in order to have your two halves of the money count, you have to match symbols. This is how the challenge was par partly ensured that you go to other uh, neighborhoods. So in this one picture we're seeing at the left, the three symbols are the tree symbol, this pillar, and the butterfly. And you have to find somebody who has those matching symbols. There aren't a lot of them, uh, different symbols, so it's fairly simple. You can grasp it pretty quickly, but you can then also see in person how those symbols match up. Second, um, the uh, symbol, the, the money is sometimes given away at local businesses, bringing people in. And I'm going to trace through one player, Justine, we'll call her, her playing trajectory. She discovered uh, the making money bonds at uh, this cake shop. Um, she had uh, a particular uh, set of uh, pieces that she was looking to match. And they're on Facebook, uh, people were posting saying, oh, do you have peach, uh, Mike, Swallowtail? Anyone got that one? Someone else says, I do, I'll message you. I'm here now at City Hall. So the mechanisms of the game were not just in one platform, but they were cross-platform. And of course, in our physical neighborhoods, where I think we can learn a lot, one platform never rules them all. Instead, life is lived across platforms. Sometimes the platform is the platform of the city. Sometimes the platform is Facebook. Sometimes the platform is Instagram. And we let the players do some of that uh, circulation across systems. Um, after they meet on Facebook, the, the pictures become a piece of that broader visibility. And finally, the players then went and spent their money at a local business where they could then further continue the conversation and the feedback loops of the game system. So I think that feedback loops in many ways are a better way to express the heart of what we're talking about um, with, uh, with games than, than something like points or, uh, or challenges. And I've heard different descriptions, but for me, I picked this language in my book to talk about playful challenges and feedback loops because it's plain speak, but also it best differentiates how games are different than other engagement strategies. Um, I wanted to show a little bit more and get to our third example um, by talking a little about city data. Here's an example from Mexico City. Uh, in Mexico City, this experimental game in 2015 called Mapaton uh, was launched. Now, Mexico, is an, Mexico City is a really interesting place in terms of transportation. It has a large transportation system with 14 million rides a day. However, an interesting piece of this is that many of the rides are by private companies who can start their own routes, and therefore, the routes are not known by the city government. The city actually doesn't have a comprehensive maps of its own transit system. So the city wanted to map some of these routes partly in order to do things like be able to provide uh, routing information and suggestions on apps and otherwise. Um, and in order to do this, they created this gamified system to map the city. So the gamification project was, can we map our own city using an app as people are riding the buses around Mexico City? And in just a couple weeks, 40% of these routes were mapped, uh, which I think is a, an incredibly successful data collection project for a, an experimental project. But I, I raise it here uh, for our discussions, partly for the feedback loop. So the feedback loop here initially gave points for every ride that you took, every piece of the city that you mapped. But what the city discovered in Mexico City, the government dis discovered that the richer neighborhoods were being mapped much more than the poorer neighborhoods. There were, in other words, some inequalities and some uh, that were being uh, 
represented in the data as it was collected. And what they did was they altered the feedback loop by beginning to give more points for the lower income neighborhoods. Some of this is because uh, the, the um, users who had cell phones uh, that could uh, have data plans and do some of the tracking were disproportionately in richer neighborhoods. It was also the game was more visible in those spaces. What they did find though, that they could significantly shift where the game was doing its work, how that labor was happening by shifting the point system. And maybe most importantly, this did not feel like manipulation uh, to the players, uh, but rather it can be seen as we're all in this together, not just uh, in order to map our city and make our city more visible to all of us. So everyone could buy into the collective goal and, uh, and contribute uh, in ways that the feedback loop was helping guide them. Uh, this is a, a critical point that I, I want to underscore, that the players were not doing it just for points or for some motivation just of the game system, but they bring their own extrinsic motivation to that game. Uh, and this is especially important with community games. As we talk about community and community building, it's crucial to focus on the fact that people are in that community often to get to know each other. Um, and it can cheapen some of the true nature of community to start giving points for everything. Um, it, it, and I think that therefore to stay focused on what the goals are uh, and to give and, and to help people understand how their participation advances their the goals of the community and their own personal reasons for joining the community it, in some ways is a much more authentic way and, and, and keeps the game system from feeling too brittle and even from feeling manipulative. Here it can feel authentic because the project is to help map our city better and everyone can participate. And when the feedback loops change, when the point system uh, changes, it reflects something uh, deeper. So I wanna uh, talk then about the, the last principle, uh, which is uncertain outcomes. Uh, when you know exactly what's going to happen, uh, it's no longer a game. You're just executing something in a linear fashion. And I actually think some of our gamification systems have this. It's very clear, oh, you do X and you get two points. You do Y and you get 10 points and I'll just keep ramping up. And it's, it's in some ways just kind of a race. The only uncertainty is who will be at the top. The only uncertainty in other words is the leaderboard. I think for communities to base all the uncertainty on competition is often not the kind of community that many people want to be a part of. Uh, do you want to be a, a member of a neighborhood where you know that you were the fastest person on your block? O occasionally, a little of that is fine. I don't, I'm not against competition, but I actually think that a lot of communities are about that kind of togetherness. And so uh, the idea that you're the best in your community only goes so far. And this is why gamification is so brittle, why it may work great for attracting 10% of the population. But if you ever try to reach 50%, uh, with gamification that is really just focused on competition between members, I think that it will actually start undermine, undermining the community itself. And this is a, a really serious risk uh, for gamification projects. So the uncertain outcomes um, are a, a, bet, a good way of expressing what we want to balance instead. Um, the uncertainty is, I didn't phrase this in terms of competition versus cooperation, because I, I think we should leave that up a little bit to the designers, but we do want some uncertainty in the system. I wanted to show how that uncertainty can build on existing things in our communities in a very physical sense. Here's another example from Mexico City with a fountain. This was a cool fountain. It has uh, 50, uh, actually I think it's more like 25 uh, different jets. And each of the jets of water can be individually controlled. And in this fun project, these pressure pads were put around um, that could offer some uh, uh, young people in particular a chance to come up and make a little um, interactive display by uh, having this jet go on then this jet and, and create almost like writing a little program, but they don't write any code. They just jump on different blocks and then the corresponding jets pop up. Uh, I think this is a, a really exciting project because again, for that visibility for others, for the feedback that is, that is immediate and for the uncertainty in what will you make? What, what, what will you make is a kind of uncertainty that is not at all about competition. You could turn this into a competition, but I think that a lot of our city spaces have evolved around something other than competition, around building instead a sense of community and collective and, uh, and group engagement. So uh, what I wanted to then uh, show is a, another example, a little bit more digital as we start bringing more digital into it. Um, let's see, here we go. Um, this is a, a game in New York City uh, called Commons. 
And Commons was a game uh, that uh, was launched in order to gather data about the city that the city could could use. So it was a gamification project to do some some data collection. Um, one of the interesting things is that uh, players, as they race around different neighborhoods in Lower Manhattan, um, looking for things like here's uh, in, in this particular picture, uh, here are some bricks that need to be repaired. It's just uh, yes, at least they have a barricade over it. It's, it's not quite as dangerous as it could be, but this is an eyesore and it's potentially dangerous. One of the things that uh, when players submit their this picture, the feedback loop is structured that their their picture is only accepted if they vote on someone else's. So that's what you're seeing at the top right. Um, cast your vote. Which uh, which problem do you see? Too much garbage, and that's on the left. Or do you think it's more compelling to focus on the need for bike racks in this picture? So you. What we've, what we've then done is made the individual player more aware of the group. The feedback loop is bringing a kind of social awareness, uh, some peripheral vision to play. And at the same time, it's also giving players a chance to participate in the feedback loops of other people's experiences. The, the voting mechanism, the feedback loop of voting, quickly led people to put themselves in the picture. Why? because it's actually more compelling. You get more votes for your pictures if you start to dramatize what is happening. And I think this is a really interesting way in which the uncertainty of the system uh, allowed people to be a little bit more playful uh, and even theatrical with their data collection. They didn't just take pictures of things like, here's where we need better handicap accessibility. Here's where a curb cut could be put in. But they take a picture of themselves pretending to trip over the curb cut. And this dramatization of data collection is a great example of how true playfulness in a community spirit can become part of systems in much better ways than just give people five points for every time they report a problem. What we don't need is civic complaint systems that give people points for complaining, which is actually what I think is the dominant use of gamification in city data collection um, and engagement with things like pothole reporting. Um, I think that playful systems that instead encourage engagement, encourage uh, people to role play uh, and, and participate through their own visible uh, engagement with public space is much more consistent with how communities actually work right now. So the uncertainty here is, is partly what will they find? Um, the uncertainty is what pictures will they encounter? Uh, and, and it's much a broader, and I would argue much richer, the uncertainty is much richer than simply giving points. Uh, again, points, fee, uh, leaderboards, those are great. I, I don't have anything strictly against them, but I would argue it's not enough. It's far too brittle if we're talking about the complex realities of communities that we actually want to be living in. I wanted to highlight from the book uh, some of the game mechanics that we find in cities that might be of interest. Um, game mechanics, uh, and in particular, ties the outcomes that come through the, those game mechanics. Um, games can lead to network building um, where people are meeting each other. That's one form of, of game design. Another, games can help develop shared beliefs and a sense of place. Third, games can build a sense of associational life. What are the organizations that are doing work? And, and last, games can contribute to the local flows and news of, and information of communities as communities are trying to figure out who are we, what, what exists, what are our assets, how can we move forward? That range of outcomes, I would argue, is a richer list than often uh, cities approach gamification with. And, and I provide it in part to encourage city agencies and all of you as you're doing your work to think broadly about outcomes beyond just engagement. This is a much deeper set of outcomes. And frankly, there's more money in these outcomes. These are some of the outcomes that receive real investment from cities. And I think the gamification can tap increasingly into those. In fact, uh, I wanted to uh, argue that some of what we um, need to see in our gamification projects is uh, tapping into the richness that is already at scale. Um, communities are already at scale. Uh, and, I, and I say this partly because we sometimes forget that the physical world has massive scale, right? There are thousands and thousands and thousands of local communities already doing playful things, already doing things like neighborhood festivals, uh, parades, um, birthday parties in public. There's all sorts of ways in which a barbecue that can, can connect a few neighbors or even just a, an open uh, uh, softball game or game of soccer uh, could connect 
residents. Uh, but what's changing partly, the paradigm that's shifting and making gamification and games and game engaged uh, design so important is partly that the digital and the physical are starting to come together. So the, uh, what I show in the next row here, you see this bench. This is a, a musical bench, uh, as opposed to just being furniture, it's furniture with a little bit of a digital side. Old objects like newspaper boxes uh, are beginning to emerge with a, with a digital side as well. And I think we're gonna see only more engagement with digital physical hybrids. And even old things like here's a payphone um, from a design uh, collaborative that I, that I worked on um, that was reimagined for physical space. The, the key being uh, cell phones are a very individual experience. We look down at our own phone, but Things like payphones can catch the public's eye. This was one that we um, mounted a speaker on uh, and it became a public music and PA system that people wanted to engage with and a launching point for play. Uh, play, I think, in cities doesn't just begin at the app store. It doesn't just begin on a website. It often begins in physical space. And so the design in physical space often includes theatrical objects, uh, not just posters and QR codes. Uh, so this is part of the future of cities. We're seeing play engage with cities in new ways, and it's an incredible growth area for gamification. At the same time, I would argue that some of the deeper principles that I've talked about here in, in terms of playful challenges, in terms of feedback loops, and in terms of uncertainty uh, are actually deeper principles that even in purely online gamification and online communities, we can also learn from. All right, well, that's the overview I wanted to provide. I'm glad to uh, open it up uh, for questions. Great, thank you so much, Benjamin. What and there are a good uh, question. So, um, so I will. I'll, I'll help you by sort of handling some of the questions to it for here. So, um, so I, one of the one of the questions that that's come up, and I think it's kind of it is very. It's going to be relevant across across your work, but is is in terms of tar, this is two 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 sides to it really. Um, a lot of community initiatives, um, certainly certainly they have they are around in the UK are um, around how do we um, increase engagement of vulnerable people, so targeting particularly disadvantaged groups. Um, so, so one side to, because to, Jessica's got a question here about how can we ensure, on one of your examples, how do we ensure safety, that she was talk, thinking about the Mac, Mac, on, Mac on Money example. Um, can you comment something about, about those, those two aspects? Firstly, how do we ensure safety when we're doing a gamification initiative, which is obviously for 100% of the population, but then also how do we target gamification initiatives towards disadvantaged populations? Yeah, that, that's a great question. And first, um, I just wanted to point out that this is a question that cities have to deal with all the time, right? This is if, if you uh, don't handle this as a mayor, you're not going to make it to the next uh, election. So there are high stakes in cities for, for engaging the vulnerable, the poor, um, those who, who have less advantage. Uh, in terms of making money, just to use that as an example, um, one of the things they did for the game was encourage people to meet at existing public events. So um, on, on, in Macon, um, the, the uh, time of the week that was considered the most segregated in some ways was Sunday morning because the churches were often segregated by race. Uh, the the African-American churches and the white churches were, were often very different. And already in the community, there were groups of people who were organizing a concert series in the afternoons on Sunday to bring people together and try to cross some of those lines. So when the game project came along, what they said was we should build on top of that and encourage people to do their uh, meeting of strangers in those public spaces at those safe places. So this is, this is, I think, the best gamification strategy is don't go it alone. Don't try to invent this on your own, but instead leverage the meeting places where people already are. In terms of the equity for reaching people, this also came up in the making money game. What they saw was that uh, they were getting fewer uh, participants from the uh, the poorer neighborhoods participating. Well, this is something that they can then compensate for uh, with targeted outreach. So the game then the game organizers began mailing a disproportionate share of game tokens to some of the poorer neighborhoods. Uh, partly uh, on interviews, we found out some way why there was less trust in the poor neighborhoods that it was real. There was a lot more people who were just throwing it in the trash. Oh, it's just a, like a lottery ticket. I get so many of these kind of fake things. Um, and, and how do you build trust in neighborhoods that have historically been marginalized and kept out? This is something, again, 
that cities are already dealing with. And as we bring gamification into cities, we need to keep engaging with. So I think it's a great question. Last point on it, uh, which is at the design level, um, we, when we design with communities rather than for them, I think our oper uh, the chances that we'll have a good equitable solution goes up even more. We can talk about some of the principles of participatory, participatory design as well. Yeah, definitely. No, the, the, the participatory design is something something I think all of us in gamification need to do more of, particularly in engaging the player, isn't it? I mean, so often we, we talk about player-centered design because we, we forget to engage the player in the design, and it's something that players just get given once it's once it's once it's there, um, we do have a question on kind of on some around your design sort of thinking. Um, so let's pull that up. So um, when you think you you talk quite a lot in your talk about playfulness, and clearly that's an important part of uh, the way in which you um, approach gamification. Do you see do you see there being a sort of a, a separate thing, playful design, or uh, that is part of gamification? Is gamification always encompassing play? How do you kind of uh, uh, explain play within a, within within the sort of a, a context of gamification. Yeah, I think it's a great question, um, and I, I think there isn't a single answer. Uh, in fact, I resist two clean answers on this, and I would encourage everyone here to avoid single simple answers because the history of play is long. Uh, it's much older than using things like technologies. Um, it's actually in communities provide maybe the best physical communities provide be maybe the best demonstrations of this that play play is ancient uh, and culture is complicated um, and I think that if we tr if we're bold enough and brave enough to engage in that space and to build play and gamification uh, we can tap into something deeper um, I think that in terms of a definition are they equivalent they're they're different and they and I think they're they have different kinds of power yeah um, and where, which what sort of use cases are you seeing? local communities local governments kind of where 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 are we finding the 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 hottest sort of places now for for innovation and, and for projects i mean where what, what's i mean if, if we're talking with our you know local communities here and in, in our where where we are what sort of things i mean we you've talked about kind of pothole finding as a kind of a common sort of thing but what what other what other aspects are have been uh, do you see as really ripe for gamification yeah well i think that this comes frankly back to the market side of things um and or government intervention. Um, the, the money in community engagement, and this is funny, we're here on the community day, right? Um, cities historically invest very tiny sums of money in terms of, of community engagement. There's much more in economic development. So games like Making Money that I talked about are much more likely to be funded as economic development projects. The problem there is the people doing economic development are hardly ever willing to be playful. It's not that the gamification is what they're missing, that they are unwilling to have the spirit of playfulness. They instead want a big skyscraper, that big money means serious. And so I think that that's the, that's the real question. It's a cultural nut to crack more than a technological one uh, for some of the, the larger dollar. We're seeing a lot of gamification kind of projects where there is a certain scale of budget and a clear problem around engagement. So I'd say that they're, they're problem solving. Often government is doing, doing these kinds of efforts, um, but there's also uh, neighborhood associations, uh, business associations who say, we want a bunch of people turning out uh, to get attention to local businesses. Uh, there, th there's a lot around business development uh, in terms of awareness and kind of advertising marketing, and then a certain amount around civic projects and getting the citizenry engaged. Um, I think yeah. that's only at the beginning. And where, I mean, obviously we've got, I mean, you've got the great resource in your book. And where, where else can we point? So, say we have got a business association that wants to do, wants, wants to, wants to, want, looking for ideas for playful economic development in their local area. What, what sort of resources would you point them to? Yeah, I, I, th I actually think that uh, one of my biggest piece of advice for developers is to go lower tech than you initially mm. think. So you might think, oh, I could do an interesting augmented reality thing. Yeah, but if you use text messaging, no one has to download an app and people don't have, the barrier to entry is so much more accessible and you can text people videos, you can text sound. It's a technology that, that is still there and very vibrant. So uh, I've actually been seeing a bunch of really interesting text message with QR project, QR codes. QR codes, by the way, you could scan a QR code and it pre-fills out a whole text message. Uh, mm -hmm. Twilio, as a global company that uh, is building a, a cloud telephony, you know, you want to call a big phone system, your airline uh, is, is delayed due to the, the, the weather, they might be using Twilio. But this is a, now they have tools like Twilio Studio that anybody could go in and build uh, SMS response engines and bots. 
Um, I think it's a really interesting design space as, as an example of, of where we could grow um, w w at very low cost. The design costs there to build games uh, are, are pretty low. Yeah, no, that's a great steer. I, 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 yeah, I've done some Twitter development, and it is it is it is re re relatively easy to create something quite sophisticated that um, without without much difficulty. And I think, I mean, uh, great. I, I didn't know about QR codes being able to transfer it directly into SMS messages as well. That's definitely something to for for, for to try out. And uh, there's plenty of gamifiers, I think, who are who are kind of uh, engaged in this this kind of. Um, uh, engaged in this in, in the sort of the, the the physical space and are looking for new ideas and so um, it would be great to sort of keep the keep the communities talking. I think this has already been a really great talk from you just to talk about the, how do we bring the two communities together. The people that want to do something locally to 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 bring develop their 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 local area to develop their citizenry, but also the kind of the gamifiers with great ideas, great playful um, concepts. So I think. Benjamin, thank you very much indeed. It's been a fantastic book, fantastic talk. Please, guys, go and check out uh, Benjamin's book, uh, Locally Played, uh, available in all good bookstores, particularly Amazon, obviously. And um, uh, thank you very much for coming and joining us today. Thank you, Benjamin. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you. Cheers.